Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Genome Webinars. I'm Ben Butkus, Editorial Director at Genome Web. The title of today's webinar is Spatial Expression Analyses Elucidate Mechanisms of CERC RNAs in Cancer, and is sponsored by Advanced Cell Diagnostics, a biotechnic company. Our speakers today will be Lassa Somar Christensen, Associate Professor in the Department of Biomedicine at Aarhus University, and Anushka Dikshit, Application Scientist at Advanced Cell Diagnostics. Attendees may type in a question at any time during the webinar. You can do this through the Q&A panel, which appears on the right side of the webinar presentation. If you look to the bottom of your window, there are a series of widgets to enhance your webinar experience. With that, I'll turn it over to Lassa Sommer Christensen of Aarhus University. Please go ahead, Lassa. Hello, everyone. Thank you for the introduction and for the opportunity to present some of our recent data here today. So first, uh, in this webinar, I'll give a a uh, broad introduction to the circular RNA research field with a specific focus on circular RNA biology and cancer before uh, sharing with you some of our recent uh, results, which were actually quite surprising uh, to us, the results we got with uh, respect to a specific circular RNA in, uh, in cancer. I'll get back to that. So first, I want to put circular RNAs into an epigenetic context. So this figure here you see is uh, from a very nice review uh, published by Peter Jones and co-workers in 2008. And I'm sure if Peter Jones had known at the time about the gene regulatory potential of circular RNAs, he would have put some circles down here together with the other non-coding uh, RNAs. Uh, however, circular RNAs were actually detected more than 40 years ago in eukaryotic cells through uh, using electron microscopy in HeLa cells. These data were uh, published in Nature but after that, the following more than 30 years, circular RNAs were almost completely forgotten about in the scientific literature. So not until 2012, and in particular in 2013, uh, something really started to happen, especially with the publication of these two papers here, back-to-back uh, -back in Nature in 2013 for the first time showing that endogenous circular RNA molecules can have a biologically relevant function through sponging of microRNA molecules. So individual circular RNAs were found to have a large number of microRNA binding sites and to be able to bind these microRNAs and thereby indirectly regulate the translation of the microRNA target genes. So following this and other publications, the field of circular RNAs and cancer really uh, started. So if you go to PubMed and type in circular RNAs and cancer search terms, you'll see that uh, only after 2012, 2013, papers start to be published in this field. And now in 2020, we have more than a thousand uh, circular RNA papers published in the field of cancer. I want to mention also, uh, sorry, I think there's some background noise. Maybe someone needs to uh, uh, mute the microphone. Yes, okay, so uh, I just want to mention that all of these uh, Background publications here are not related to endogenous uh, circular RNAs, but related to circular RNAs produced from viruses, which are also relevant in cancer. So it's not until 2000, 
uh, after 2012 and 2013 that something really started to happen and uh, this field was uh, born, you could say. So why was circular outlays almost forgotten for all of these years? First of all, you need to actively look for the circular RNAs in order to be able to detect them. So if you look in panel A here, uh, if you want to detect a circular RNA with PCR, you would actually have to design your primers so that they face away from each other as illustrated here. Of course, no one in their right mind would design PCR primers like this unless specifically looking for a circular RNA. So down below here, you can see that if these exons here are circularized, the primers will now face towards each other and create a specific PCR product for this uh, circular RNA, which can then be detected by gel electrophoresis, as shown in panel B, or by Sanger sequencing, as shown in panel C, for these uh, six different circular RNAs that we studied uh, uh, in this paper that I have uh, cited here. I also want to mention that when you use next generation sequencing for the study of circular RNAs, you really have to actively look for the circular RNAs in question in order to be able to detect them. And this is because only the reads that span this backsplicing junction region as illustrated to the right are unique uh, for the circular RNA in question. And these reads do actually not align to a linear reference genome. So in most um, commonly used bioinformatic algorithms, these reads are just discarded and not used in the analysis. So you have to use a dedicated uh, bioinformatic algorithms for the detection of circular RNAs and RNA sequencing data. So how are these circular RNAs actually generated within our cells? Most circular RNAs are derived from protein coding genes. And more unique circular RNAs have now been annotated than we have protein coding genes within our cells. And this uh, is thanks to next generation sequencing studies using these bioinformatic, specific dedicated bioinformatic uh, algorithms that I just mentioned before. If you look at the figure here uh, in the top, you have a, a depiction of a, a gene consisting of exons and introns. And in this case here, a circular RNA is generated between the gray exon and the green uh, exon here. And in order for this uh, back splicing uh, to take place, which is necessary for the circular RNA to be generated, a looping structure needs to be created. And this can be done in different ways. First, uh, and, and often this happens through base pairing between inverted homologous uh, repetitive sequences, such as allo elements, as illustrated on the left side, or through dimerization of RNA binding proteins as illustrated uh, uh, on the right side. And then these uh, splice sites can uh, come in close proximity and the canonical splicing machinery can carry out the spec splicing leading to a circular RNA uh, that you see in the bottom, uh, which can either be consisting only of the exons or the intron can be retained most often the introns will be spliced out. Circular RNAs can be generated in other ways as well, which I'll not go into here. And also our cells have actually evolved uh, systems to suppress formation of some of these circular RNAs uh, generated by base pairing between allo elements as illustrated to the right. If you're more interested into uh, circular RNA biogenesis, you can have a look at our recent uh, re review paper from 2019, which I have uh, referenced down here below. So what makes circular RNAs so special apart from their circular uh, structure? First of all, this circular structure makes the circular RNAs 
uh, very uh, stable within our cells. And this high stability is often directly related to the functions that these circular RNAs may carry out within our cells. Most circular RNAs are exported to the cytoplasm. And since circular RNAs do not have a cap structure and polyate tails, it was an enigma in the field for quite some time how these circular RNAs get exported to the uh, cytoplasm. Uh, and not until uh, the Villus group found this length-dependent evolutionary conserved pathway that controls nuclear export of circular RNAs, it became clear how circular RNAs can be exported to the cytoplasm. Another interesting point is that many circular RNAs are highly conserved through species indicating that they may have important uh, functions. Many circular RNAs are also uh, more abundant than their cognate linear host genes. Here I'm showing you some of uh, our unpublished data where we studied human embryonic stem cells and differentiated these cells into neural progenitor cells for four days and for 11 days. So in the figure to the left, you see uh, each dot in this plot corresponds to a circular RNA. And on the y-axis, you have a circular to linear ratio. And on the x-axis, you have the uh, expression, the average expression of each individual circular RNA. And you can see in the stem cell, uh, about 5% of the circular RNAs were more abundant than their linear host genes. This number increases when we differentiate the cells for four days, uh, which you see in the middle panel, uh, and even further when we have differentiated the cells for 11 days. Uh, at this time point, uh, nearly 20% of the circular RNAs are more abundantly expressed than their linear host genes. Another interesting thing that we often see in many different systems is that circular RNA expression changes often occur independently of changes in the linear host genes. So uh, in the bottom of this slide, I show you some data where we compare uh, fold changes between some uh, cells that were sensitive towards a specific drug and a um, uh, resistant counterpart that were developed. On the y-axis, you have uh, the fold change in host gene expression. And on the x-axis, you have the fold change in circular RNA expression. And if these circular RNA expression changes were uh, occurring dependently on the linear, so co-occurring with changes in the linear host genes, all of these dots, which each correspond to an individual circular RNA, would be on the diagonal here and we would have a high correlation between the two. This is, as you can see, really not the case. So the majority of these circular RNAs were actually changed independently of changes in their host genes. So what do these circular RNAs do, or how do they function within our cells? I already mentioned that the majority of the circular RNAs are uh, thought to be non-coding. A few examples of circular RNAs that can function as templates for translation have been published in the literature. This, of course, needs to be kept independent uh, translation through IRES uh, elements, and, and the circular RNAs, of course, also need to have uh, an AUG site in order for them to initiate translation. But this is uh, uh, probably a very limited phenomenon, uh, limited to a very to few circular RNAs under certain circumstances. Otherwise, circular RNAs can interact with other molecules in the cytoplasm, as already mentioned. They can interact with microRNAs. They can also interact with proteins and function as protein sponges, as illustrated in panel B. They can function as enhancers of protein function through being a structural component of a protein complex, 
or as uh, protein scaffolds bringing enzymes in close proximity to their substrates, or even as uh, functioning as uh, recruiters of specific proteins to be specific DNA sequences within the cells. But in cancer, uh, most circular RNAs that have been studied have been proposed to function as microRNA sponges. In the next slide here, uh, I'll just briefly go through how one of the most studied circular RNAs in cancer is uh, thought to function. This is also the circular RNA that I'll show you some of my own uh, data on in a second. This circular RNA was named SIR7 because it has a high number of microRNA7 binding sites within its sequence. So seven, if you look to the right-hand side within the nucleus, so seven is expressed from the X chromosome uh, from a promoter uh, a region, uh, also um, uh, annotated to a, a link RNA. This uh, link RNA and the circular RNA is, you, you hardly ever see any expression from uh, transcripts containing all these uh, exons, probably because the back splicing is so efficient uh, that you don't see these exons co-occurring. But when this back splicing of the so seven exons have taken place, so seven is exported into the cytoplasm where it can bind microRNA seven molecules. And in the normal situation uh, where you uh, are not in a cancer cell, so seven uh, is not overexpressed, and microRNA seven is free to bind to its uh, mRNA targets, many of which are oncogenes, as illustrated in the top. However, in cancer, so seven has been shown to often be overexpressed, and it is thought then that it binds a large number of microRNA seven molecules, and thereby uh, relief the oncogenes from being suppressed by microRNA7, as illustrated on the right-hand side. And then this can, in turn, lead to proliferation and increased metastasis of the cancer cells. This is what I refer to as the sponsoring theory for microRNA7 uh, and SIR7 in cancer in, uh, future, in uh, some of the next slides. So, so seven is probably the most studied circular RNA in cancer. There's a high number of publications uh, focusing on so seven in many different uh, tumors. And I want to also emphasize that so seven is also known as CDR1 antisense. Um, but the vast majority of all these papers uh, many more than those that I show here have now been published. The vast majority of these propose circular, uh, sorry, SIR7 to function through microRNA7 as a sponge uh, through that mechanism that I just explained in the previous slide. One paper is kind of going against the tide, uh, recently published in Cancer Cell, showing that SIR7 can function independently of microRNA7 in malignant melanoma. The data I'm going to show you in a second is related to colon cancer. So I just want to uh, highlight some of the key findings from this uh, very nice publication from Wang and co-workers focusing on SIR7 in colorectal cancer. So what they found was that SIR7 is much more abundant in the tumors relative to adjacent normal tissues that you see in the left-hand panel here. And also that high expression of SIR7 was uh, associated with a poor overall survival in the patients. They also found that SIR7 was uh, negatively correlated with MIA7 in, when studying uh, tumor specimens from uh, colorectal cancer patients. Uh, but positively correlated with oncogenes such as EDR, EGFR and RAF1. Finally, they also found that in cell lines uh, to the 
what you see uh, on the right hand side of this slide that when over expressing SIR7 in these cell lines, they could show that SIR7 over expression leads to increased migration and invasion and proliferation of these cells. And this was uh, through micro functioning through microRNA7. And the same was uh, the case in uh, xenograft mouse models as shown on the left hand side. I'm not going to go into details with all of these experiments here uh, due to uh, time limitations. I just want to mention that we found this work very impressive and interesting and therefore wanted to study SIR7 further in colon cancer. And we set out to uh, figure out whether SIR7 uh, is subject to intratumor heterogeneity with uh, respect to its expression levels and whether it was also how it was expressed in the tumor microenvironment. So in order to do this, we used the RNA scope assay from ACD. Um, and surprisingly, what we found was that so 7 was actually completely absent in the cancer cells. So what you see here is uh, on the panel A, a poorly differentiated colon cancer, you can see that within the stromal cells, you have a strong uh, signal for SIR7 represented by the red dots. And within the cancer cells, these cells were completely uh, negative for SIR7 staining. And this also, uh, uh, it was the same we also found in uh, highly differentiated colon cancers as shown in panel B. This was very puzzling to us in light of all the previous findings of SIR7 uh, that it was expected to function through uh, inhibition of microRNA7 in the cancer cells. So we uh, further studied many more uh, cancer uh, uh, samples from, from patients and found the same result again. And we also wanted to confirm these findings using a completely uh, different methodology. So next we turn to laser capture microdissection, where we could specifically cut out the stromal cells and put into one tube and cut out the cancer cells and put into the to another tube as illustrated on the left hand side here, and then analyze expression of SIR7 separately within these two compartments using nanostring encounter technology which is a hybridization-based technology illustrated on the right here. So in line with the uh, in situ findings using RNA scope, we found that we only got a strong SIR7 signal from the stromal cells in these uh, fractions uh, from the laser capture microdissected cells. So, so on the left-hand side here, you see um, an experiment where we pooled um, uh, from four different patients in order to get enough material. And this was then repeated for another four independent patients. Uh, and again, we saw the same uh, uh, in the second experiment, which you see to the right here. As I mentioned uh, before, uh, so seven expression is driven uh, from a promoter region upstream, uh, which is annotated uh, as a link RNA, as illustrated here. This was nicely shown by a publication by Barrett and co-workers in PLUS Genetics some years ago now. And uh, to further uh, uh, validate that SIR7 expression is exclusively uh, limited to the stromal cells, we also studied uh, these uh, transcripts of this upstream link RNA. So what we saw was that only the T3 transcript of this link RNA was expressed uh, in the laser capture microdissected samples and only in the stromal cells. This result you can see in panel D. Then we analyzed more than 30 uh, colorectal cancer specimens and again found that uh, the T3 transcript was most abundantly expressed among these patient samples as illustrated in E. 
In S and G, you can see that T1 and T2 correlated very poorly with so seven expression, where, whereas T3 correlated positively with so seven expression. So together, all of these data indicate that so seven is actually only expressed in the stromal cells and not in the cancer cells. Here, I'm showing you some other in situ data uh, where you can see that so 7 is actually not expressed in normal colon epithelium and also not expressed in uh, adjacent adenomas. And we interpret these findings as so 7 not being uh, shut down or downregulated uh, during cancer evolution, but just not being expressed in the cancer initiating cells. And that's why all the cancer cells are negative for so 7 expression. So we also analyzed a number of MIR-7 target genes uh, listed here uh, within the um, colon cancer uh, specimens, and we found some positive correlations between some of these oncogenes and SIR-7 as highlighted here. This, uh, these positive correlations are, of course, in line with the microRNA7 response theory. But on the other hand, we actually also found some negative correlations, which could not be explained by the sponging theory. So this was, uh, of course, a little bit puzzling to us. So we wanted to investigate this in more detail. And we investigated the expression of all of these genes in the laser capture microdissected fractions of cancer cells and stromal cells. And what really stood out when we uh, plotted this data was that, as you can see here, FOSS and these two other genes over here were much more, uh, sorry, uh, I was pointing with my mouse error. So if you just look at the genes that are underscored by blue lines, um, you can see that these genes that correlated positively with SIR7 were much more abundant in the stromal cells than in the cancer cells, whereas the genes that correlated negatively with SIR7 here underscored by orange lines were much more abundant in the cancer cells on the other hand. So uh, this was quite striking, and I wanted to investigate this in a bit more detail so what I did next was to uh, arrange all of these genes according to whether they were expressed mainly in the stromal compartment or in the cancer cell compartment. So if you uh, look to the left in the top panel, you see that I arranged all the genes according to whether they were expressed in the stromal cells mainly or in the cancer cells mainly. So to the left, you have the genes that were mainly expressed in the stromal cells in the middle, there was really no difference between the expression. And to the right, these genes were more expressed in the cancer cells. And then down below, you have a correlation matrix of how these genes correlated with SIR7 or as CDR1 antisense, as it is also called. Uh, and what really meets the eye here is that you have more blue on the left-hand side so more positive correlations with the genes that are more in the stromal cells and more orange on the right-hand side or more uh, negative correlations with the genes that are more in the cancer cells. So I wanted to see if this finding was actually statistically significant. So what I did on the right-hand side was to plot on the y-axis the data you have on the top, all the uh, red bars, and on the x-axis, I plotted all the correlations with SIR7 for each of these individual microRNA7 genes. And as you can see, the correlation between uh, the fold changes in stromal cells uh, relative to cancer cells and the correlation with SIR7 was highly significant. So these uh, data was, of course, not really in line with the microRNA response theory. So in order to study this further, uh, we decided to uh, knock 
out the seven using CRISPR-Cas9 in hex cells to further study uh, FOSS, which was the gene that correlated uh, most significantly with SIRS7. And what you can see uh, here is that when we knock out SIRS7, we see uh, less SIRS7 uh, signal in the cells relative to the control cells. The reason why we do see a signal is that here we analyze the populations, so not all of the cells will have SIRS7 knocked out. When analyzing FOSS expression, there was actually no difference uh, in the expression of FOSS, whether we uh, knocked out SIRS7 or not, or, or, or not. So that you can see on the top right-hand side. We further did a reporter assay and actually surprisingly found that um, the FOSS 3' UTR actually did not respond to MIR7 at all. And this was, uh, of course, a little bit puzzling to us. But then we actually found out that the strong microRNA7 binding sites that are present in the mouse version of FOSS is actually not conserved to the human version of FOSS, at least not according to target scan. So this is probably why uh, this reporter didn't respond to microRNA7. But again, these results are uh, suggesting that the correlations we observed for SIRS7 with FOSS are probably not explained through the microRNA response theory. We wanted also to investigate the expression of SIRS7. So using nanostring technology, again, using a panel for nearly 800 microRNAs, we studied all of these microRNAs in the laser capture micro dissected samples and found that SIRS7 was only detected above the background levels in the cancer cells and not in the stromal cells. These results you can see on the left-hand side. Then to confirm these uh, data using an in situ technology, we used this novel uh, technology from ACD called microRNA scope HD. And Again, here we could actually see that microRNA7 was only detectable in the cancer cells and not in the stromal cells, as illustrated by all the arrows here in panel A in the uh, inserts, uh, black and red, and not in the green insert or highlight, as you can see here. Panel B and C are just some positive and negative controls for this experiment. So uh, I just want to emphasize that this was actually just the very first experiment we performed. And we didn't do a single uh, optimization for getting this assay to work because we were under uh, pressure. And this was an experiment that was suggested by the reviewers. And we had a deadline and was also challenged by uh, corona lockdown at the time. So. Um, uh, nevertheless, these results were uh, perfectly uh, in line with what we saw in the laser capture microdissected samples. So how do we actually explain these observed correlations? So I, in order to explain these correlations, I uh, came up with this relatively simple model where uh, what you see in panel A is uh, a situation where so 7 is expressed together with uh, a gene within the, uh, specifically within the stromal cells, indicated here in uh, red and yellow. And if you within the a tumor specimen have a relatively high amount of stromal cells relative to cancer cells, you will see a high expression of both so 7 and this gene. On the other hand, if you have a, relative, a relatively high number of cancer cells, you will see a low expression of both of these genes, and then you will uh, observe a positive correlation. Of course, this is a very simplified model, and you would expect uh, much less nicer correlations in reality because you also have uh, other cell types within tumors. If you look to panel B, you will see what would be expected if you have so seven uh, expressed uh, exclusively in the stromal cell, 
uh, and the, another gene exclusively expressed in the cancer cells. If you have relatively more cancer cells, the gene will be highly expressed, whereas SIR7 will be lowly expressed. And uh, if you have more uh, stromal cells relative to cancer cells, SIR7 so will be more expressed relative to the gene. So I think this model quite nicely explains the correlations that we have seen in the colorectal cancer specimens uh, and uh, may actually be the explanation for these correlations uh, instead of this microRNA sponge theory that has been proposed previously. Of course, if this model is to be true, we would expect to see similar uh, results with other stromal-specific circular RNAs. So we investigated a panel uh, of um, 11 other circular RNAs as illustrated here and selected two circular RNAs that were more abundant in the stromal cells, which did not contain a single microRNA7 binding site. So these circular RNAs would, of course, not be able to sponge microRNA7. So here you see the results for CERC FBX W7 that I was pointing to in the previous slide. And again, just as we observed for CERC 7 we see positive correlation with other stromal uh, uh, cell enriched genes and negative correlations with other cancer cell, with the cancer cell enriched genes and again this uh, these correlations were highly significant the same was true for the other circular RNA ccd c66 we also had a few circular RNAs that were actually more abundant in the cancer cells and if the model were to be true, we would expect to see exactly the opposite correlations as we saw for SIR7 and the other stromal cell-specific circular RNAs. So looking at CERC CK scan 1, this is actually exactly what we see. So on uh, the left-hand side, you see uh, more red dots on the left-hand side and more uh, blue dots on the right-hand side. And this uh, was actually, again, statistically significant. The same was true for circular RNA 7F91. So I think these data are uh, very much in line with uh, the model I proposed just before. Finally, we also investigated some other tumor types. Here I'm just showing you some of them. So we found similar spatial so seven expression patterns in uh, cervix cancer, lung cancer, breast cancer, and pancreatic cancer. Uh, so in all of these tumors, the cancer cells stained negative for SIR7, whereas the stromal cells were highly positive. The a uh, different situation was actually present in other uh, tumor types. For instance, in embryonal carcinoma, we saw a strong signal from SIR7 in the cancer cells. And this was also true in malignant melanoma cells, as illustrated on the right-hand side here, in line with the paper published in Cancer Cell that I mentioned uh, in some of the previous slides where they studied SIR7 in malignant melanoma. So uh, to sum up our findings, SIR7, I think we have shown that it is not expressed in particular in colon cancer cells where we investigated this very thoroughly and most likely also not in other cancer uh, types, which we uh, uh, just here presented some preliminary data for. But on the other hand, so 7 is much more abundant in tumors relative to adjacent normal uh, tissues. So we actually also, in line with the Veng paper, see that so 7 is upregulated in tumors due to the uh, high expression in the cancer-associated stromal cells relative to adjacent normal tissues. 
And then uh, the other conclusions of our study is that correlations with MIR7 target genes are not necessarily explained by the uh, sponge theory or the CERNA hypothesis, but through variation in the relative amounts of cells with either co-expression or mutual exclusivity with SUS7 within the uh, tumor specimens. So with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and also uh, acknowledge uh, my collaborators that uh, was instrumental for being able to perform these experiments and also for the funding agencies that have been funding my research. Thank you, Lassa. As a reminder to webinar participants, if you have a question, please type it into the Q&A box in the control panel. We'll now turn the webinar over to Anushka Dikshit of Advanced Cell Diagnostics. Please go ahead, Anushka. Thank you, Ben. After that brilliant presentation by Dr. Christensen, I will now take the next 10 minutes to talk to you about the different RNA scope assays that we offer and their application in cancer research. For those of you who are not familiar with our technology, the RNA scope assay is an in situ hybridization platform that was designed to overcome the traditional limitations of an in situ hybridization assay while providing high sensitivity and specificity of detection. This assay has enabled detection of RNA biomarkers, key targets it, with tissue and morphological context. The three major parts of this assay are the target probe design, where we design a specific target probe against the transcript or gene of your interest. The amplification strategy, wherein we have designed a signal amplification system that can provide significantly high signal to noise ratio and a detection system wherein you can visualize your signal or RNA transcript as a punctate dot. We make this assay available in both chromogenic and fluorescent platforms based on your preference. This assay has been used for detection of mRNA targets, long non-coding RNA targets, splice variants, circular RNAs, uh, siRNAs, ASOs, highly homologous sequences, point mutations, and so on. We can also use this assay on a wide range of sample types, including FFPE tissues, fresh fixed frozen tissues, PBMCs, and cultured cells. Now in this slide, I'm going to go in a little bit of detail to show you how our signal amplification system works. As seen on the screen, we depict our RNA scope probe as a single Z molecule. Uh, to highlight the target binding site in the bottom and the preamplifier binding site on the top. The way we design our probes is that a pair of two ZZ probes bind onto your target sequence of interest, followed by which you have your preamplifier binding on to the ZZ pair. Then you have your amplifier bind on, and then you get your labeled probes, either chromogenic or fluorescent, bind on to the amplifiers. This forms your signal amplification tree and gives you that highly sensitive detection of even the most low expressing targets. Normally we do a pooled probe of these ZZ pairs. As I mentioned, you have to have a ZZ pair bind onto your target sequence for the preamplifier to bound. If you do not have two Z pairs bind in tandem, then you do, won't get the binding of your preamplifier sequence. As a result, the amplification tree will not be generated and you won't get any signal detection. This ensures high degree of specificity, uh, ensuring you get that high signal to noise ratio with your target. Under the RNA scope technology umbrella, we currently have three major assays. The RNA scope assay, as I mentioned, is an assay that can be used for detection of most targets that are over 300 nucleotides in length. 
The way we design our probes for these assays is we design them as 20 ZZ pair pooled probes. Currently, this assay is available in um, single plex, duplex, four plex, and up to 12 plex format. It is available both chromogenic and fluorescent formats and in both automated and manual platforms. Our base scope assay is a more specialized assay that was designed to detect shorter or smaller targets between 50 to 300 nucleotides in length. And this was designed mainly to detect splice variants, circular RNAs, short sequences, highly homologous sequences, and point mutations. The way we design our probes for the base scope assay is they are pooled probes of one to three ZZ pairs, since the sequences we are detecting with this assay are shorter. Currently, we make this assay available as single plex and duplex, uh, and in uh, the single plex is available in automated and manual formats. And finally, our newest launched assay is our microRNA scope assay that uh, Dr. Christensen described. It's an assay, as the name suggests, specifically designed to detect targets between 17 to 15 nucleotides in length, so even shorter RNA targets, and can detect siRNAs, ASOs, and microRNAs. Currently, we make this assay available as a single-plex chromogenic assay in both automated and manual formats. This slide gives you uh, the details of our current product portfolio that we offer in all the different formats. As you can see, our assays provide the flexibility of choosing the platform of your interest based on the research and application area and the target gene of interest uh, that you're looking for. Currently, we have over 26,000 catalog probes that we have already designed the probes for. But if you are working on a target that we do not have a probe for, we can design a target probe for you in less than two weeks. Please visit our website to see the uh, catalog probes that we currently offer. Next, I'm going to give you an example of each of our assays, that is the RNA scope, base scope, and microRNA scope assays. Starting with our RNA scope assay. As I mentioned, this assay is specifically for targets between 50 to 300 nucleotides in length. I'm sorry, for uh, targets over 300 nucleotides in length. And in this particular example, um, a paper that was published in Nature last year these researchers were working on a soluble factor called LIF, and they were trying to understand the role of this particular soluble factor in pancreatic cancer growth. In this particular example, they designed probes for keratin-19 and LIF to see how this LIF was expressed in pancreatic cancer cells. As you can see from the screen, uh, the red dots indicate uh, LIF staining and blue indicates keratin-19 staining. Keratin-19 marks all the pancreatic cancer cells, and LIF, as you can see, is expressed in the stroma. Using RNA scope in combination with immunofluorescence, uh, researchers showed that LIF was indeed uh, expressed in the stroma uh, along with PTPRC, which is CD45, and cancer cells, as you can see, is again marked by keratin-19 antibody, indicated in yellow. So what they showed was LIF was expressed by stromal cells, specifically the stellate cells in the stroma, and were exhibiting paracrine action on the cancer cells, uh, in turn promoting pancreatic cancer growth. They also showed that this LIF factor uh, was directly correlated with decreased disease-free survival in these pancreatic cancer patients. Next, I want to give you an example of our base scope assay, which is, again, for shorter targets between 50 to 300 nucleotides in length or for point mutation detection. In this example, we are going to learn about how this base scope assay was used to detect splice variants, specifically the Delta-16 HER2 splice variant in breast cancer and some other tumor types. In this particular paper, researchers wanted to visualize this Delta-16 HER2 splice variance in tumor samples and show
that in addition to breast cancer, other malignancies also express the splice variant. The way they did this was they used a smart probe design strategy where they designed probes against uh, exon 15 or 17, which would detect the Delta 16 splice variant, or between exon 15, 16 to detect wild type, or between exon 17, 18, that would detect both the wild type and uh, the Delta 16 variant. And then they visualized these splice variants using the base scope assay and showed that they were in, in turn, they were able to detect these splice variants in breast cancer samples, in gastric cancer tumors, and in colorectal cancer tumors. And as you can see, when they used uh, IHC to detect the splice variant, they were not able to distinguish between the wild type and the splice variant. So this technology was extremely useful in identifying patient samples that have the splice variant and potentially stratify them for Herceptin therapy. Next, we are going to look at an example of the microRNA scope assay uh, in detection of certain relevant microRNAs for cancer. Now, here's an example of how we have used our newest microRNA scope assay to detect mir 126 p in human uh, cancer tissues. So we have shown how specifically you can identify the cells expressing your target microRNA in colon cancer, cervical cancer, ovarian, and stomach cancer. In this next example, I wanted to highlight how specific this technology is, and you can design your microRNA scope target probes to your uh, microRNA of interest. Here we've shown how we are able to distinguish between the closely related let 7 a family members and detect specific um, and visualize these specific microRNAs in uh, cells within these cervical cancer tumors, showing again the specificity of our probe design. Finally, I want to introduce a new core detection workflow that we offer for detection of RNA scope signal in combination with IHC or IF. We have developed this new workflow in combination with core detection reagents that optimize your ish IHC workflow, giving you optimum RNA and protein detection of your targets. And here's an example of how we have utilized that for detection of MIR-223 in cervical cancer tissue in combination with CD3 protein. To learn more, please visit our website. And finally, I want to show you how well adopted our RD scope technology is. We have almost 3,000 publications uh, with publications in diverse research areas, cancer, neuroscience, and infectious disease being our top areas for publication. Overall, our assay is highly specific with over 26,000 catalog probes. It's highly sensitive. It allows multiplexing to visualize uh, up to 12 targets on the same section. We allow detection of small targets and allow combining your ish with your IHC or IF to visualize RNA and protein simultaneously. So you can apply this technology to a wide range of targets and applications in different research areas. And I, want, I would like to thank you for your attention today and we would take any questions. Thank you, Anushka. As a reminder to webinar participants, if you have a question, please type it into the Q&A box in the control panel. We'd also like to ask attendees to take a moment after the webinar has ended to take our exit survey and give us your feedback. We'll now start the Q&A portion of the webinar. The first question is for Lassa. If CIRS7 is not expressed in the cancer cells, how do you explain that high CRS7 expression in colorectal tumors is associated with poor overall survival? Thank you for this question. So it has actually previously been shown in colon cancer and, and in other cancers as well that uh, a high uh, tumor stromal content actually confers a um, poor prognosis in the patient. So uh, detection of a high level of so 7 could actually just be the detection of a lot of uh, stromal cells 
which, as I said, previously have been shown to be an independent uh, predictor of uh, overall survival um, and associated with a poor overall survival. So actually our results are, uh, I would, would say, in line with the previous findings. Thank you. The next question is also for Lhasa. Do you think that it applies to circular RNAs in general, that they are more abundant in the stromal cells compared to cancer cells? So in the data I presented you here today, we studied uh, 12 different circular RNAs and 10 out of these 12 circular RNAs were more abundant in the stromal cells. I think that this might indicate that circular RNAs in general may be more expressed in the stromal cells. And I think this could be related to the fact that circular RNAs are very stable molecules that are actually very slowly generated. So in fast proliferating cells, such as the cancer cells, uh, many times circular RNAs may not reach steady state levels uh, due to uh, all, all the time being diluted in the in the fast proliferating cells. So I think uh, this specific uh, nature of the circular RNA stability and slow generation uh, actually could uh, explain why we see more circular RNAs being more abundant in the stromal cells than the cancer cells. Thank you. The next question is for Anushka. Can the new miRNA scope assay detect specific siRNAs? Thank you for the question. Uh, yes, as I showed in the applications, um, I give examples of how it can detect microRNAs, but this assay is designed to also detect uh, small RNA species like siRNAs and antisense oligos. Thank you. The next question also for Anushka. Is the new RNA protein co-detection kit available for automated assays? Yes, that's a great question. Uh, we have made our new co-detection kit and workflow available for um, the RNA scope red Leica assay and the base scope uh, Leica assay. Thank you. The next question is for Lhasa. Is it possible that circular RNAs, including CIRS7, could exert an oncogenic function through the stromal cells? Uh, yes, so this I think is possible, but has not been shown yet, uh, as far as I know, at least. But uh, actually, the fact that we see so seven is much more abundant in uh, the cancer-associated uh, stromal cells may point towards uh, a specific function of circular RNAs in these cells promoting tumor genesis. But this is something that remains to be shown and something that we are now working actively on using so seven knockout mice. Thank you. That's all the time we have for today. We'd like to thank Lasse Somer Christensen of Aarhus University and Anushka Dixit of Advanced Cell Diagnostics, as well as our sponsor, Advanced Cell Diagnostics, a biotechnic company. If we didn't have time to get to your question, we will try to follow up with our experts. As a reminder, please look out for the survey after you log out to provide your feedback. If you missed any part of this webinar or would like to listen to it again, an archived version will be emailed to all attendees. Thank you for joining us for this genome webinar.